Okay, so hello and welcome everybody. This is the first of our videos for the MARS 3714 module, which will cover linear regression. And this video goes with the first section of this module, and that is a bit of a revision section, because in this section only we will consider simple linear regression. And my guess is, my hope actually, is that most of you will know most of the contents of this section. My main aim here is to get everybody on the same level and to introduce some notation and to get things going. As I said, I don't think there will be much new for most of you in this section. And new things will hopefully then start in section two later this week. Okay, let us see what we have got here in this section. Let us first have a quick look at the web page and then I will write out a few details for you so that we can consider these in a bit more detail. So first in the section I labeled preface, there is a bit of generic discussion and this plot that just explains what will happen in the module in a bit of detail. I will leave it to you to read that carefully yourself. Then section one, that is what we really should be talking about. That has three subsections. And up here, I put a summary of what we will learn in this section. And first about notation, you probably picked this up. Simple linear regression as opposed to multiple linear regression is the case where there is one input and one output. So, so the model we have is this. The inputs are the xi, the outputs which we have observed are the yi, and here we assume there is a linear or maybe affine relationship which brings us from the x to the y and some additional noise. And in the first section I discuss just the basics, namely just the standard way to find, say, this line given the points. So input are the points, x, i, y, i, and what we want is a line which goes through the points. So let's do that. The way to do that is to find a line which is in some way close to the point. And closeness is measured using the residual sum of squares. Let me just write this out. So what we want to do is to compare the observed data y, i to the value predicted by the straight line model and for the given x value xi, the predicted value is beta zero plus beta one xi. So that's what I would call the predicted value. And I should say at this point, I have slightly changed notation here, namely this quantity was called alpha on the preface and that variable was called beta, but we'll see later in the following section that that notation calling them both betas is more concise because later we can use them as component of one beta vector where just this zero and one is an index. So I introduced this already here. So what was alpha is now beta zero, what was beta is now beta one, but it's the same thing, it's just new notation. Good, now we want to say how close is yi to the predicted value. So that we do by subtracting them. And now th this could be positive or negative, and there are different ways to just turn it into an error so that negative values are just as bad as positive values. And the one which turns out best is to take the square. And that is still separate one number for each data point. So to get an overall judgment, what we do is we just sum that up over all points. So we do the sum i from one to n. And this quantity is called the residual sum of squares, and in the notes I call that r. So r beta zero beta one is then defined to be that quantity. And now what we do is we want to minimize this and writing it as a function of beta zero and beta one already makes clear what we're going to do. We are going to find the numerical values beta zero and beta one, which make this thing as small as possible, and that depends on the data xi and yi which we are given. And the answer will depend on these values xi and yi. Good. The answer is, if you go through these steps, that 
the estimator for beta 1, which I want to call beta hat 1, can be written in terms of sample covariance and sample variance. It's the sample covariance divided by the sample variance, and that is just shorthand notation for 1 over n minus 1 sum i from 1 to n xi minus the average of the x multiplied with yi minus the average of the y divided by 1 over n minus 1 sum i from 1 to n xi minus x bar squared. And if you have done any statistics, you will recognize this expression down here. That is the standard way to estimate the variance of a sample. So that's the sample variance. And you may also have seen this. That is the standard way of estimating the covariance between x and y given a sample. And that is called the sample covariance. Good. And I wrote it this way just to use the standard symbols sxy and sx squared. And you see, we can simplify this slightly by cancelling the prefactors. These dots here hide a quite lengthy derivation, so we need to think how did we actually find this minimum. But if you think about it, that is not so difficult, because that's a problem how you learn in analysis to solve them. The, it's a function where numbers go in and the number comes out, and we are looking for the minimum. So what we would do is we would take derivatives with respect to beta 0 and beta 1, and set them both equal to zero, and then we get two equations with two unknown, we solve that, and then we get this, and beta hat zero, which I haven't written yet. And I will not show this to you here, because so many of you will have seen this, but what I've done is I have written a version of this proof in the notes. So what I expect you to do is you should go through what I wrote in the notes, and there I explain one way of getting this, and there is a bit of a trick. I wrote a proof which is slightly simpler than what I've just outlined, because I don't need to do two derivatives with my trick, but still it's easy to follow, and then you will either have learned or reminded yourself where these numbers come from. Okay, let's just write the second quantity, so copy this over to the next page, and then beta hat zero, or estimator for beta zero, can be written is y bar minus beta 1 x bar, where again x bar is the average of the xi and y bar is the average of the yi. And the reason I wrote beta hat 1 first is just because this is just computed from data, whereas the convenient form to write beta 0 hat refers to beta 1 hat. Okay, there is only one more thing I want to say about this specific aspect, namely if we rewrite this equation a bit, then what we get is y bar equals beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x bar. And that means that the point x bar y bar in the plane, that is the center of gravity of the data points, that that lies on the estimated regression line, because this is the equation which gives the regression line with the estimated coefficients beta hat 0 and beta hat 1. So this means the point x bar y bar lies on the estimated regression line. Good. So this is this. And as I said, I expect you to go through the proof that beta hat 0 and beta hat 1 minimize the residual sum of squares yourself by reading it up on the web page. So this section gave kind of the mechanics of it that says if we have our collection of points, given its coordinates xi and yi, how do we compute the parameters for a straight line which somehow goes with these points? And I think we can treat this as a recipe or something like this, and I think many people will have learned this recipe already in school, or you will, if you're doing your undergraduate in Leeds, you will have seen this in Mars 1712 in your first year, and that is kind of common knowledge. So the next section it goes one step further that give things which you may or may not have seen before, but maybe in a bit new form. Namely, I want to put what we've just done into the context of statistical parameter estimation problems. So let's see how we are doing that. Linear regression is a parameter estimation problem that adds to what we have just done. And if you think back what we did in the previous subsection, there was no statistics in whatsoever. There was nothing random or so. Well, there was data, but there were no statistical methods involved. 
And if you want to turn that into a proper statistic, the thing you need is a statistical model. And the statistical model means we have to write some random variables, some random quantities, which are built so that the actual data could be a random sample of these random variables. And that's what I'm explaining in the next section. So here I have a model that says capital YI is capital because it's a random variable. We still have the lowercase xi. And the model I want to consider here is that the random output in my model comes by mapping the fixed input through the straight line. So from xi we compute beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. Then we add some random noise and because the noise is random, we get a random output. Let me just show you in the picture what that means. So in the plot, we have these points which are scattered around the line and our statistical model says these deviations, the residuals, they are random. So that's what's really going on. It's a model which describes the scattering around the line as randomness. And the way to write that is what I've done here. Again, you should read what I wrote here with some attention and some care. And the question I want to discuss here a bit is what does this actually buy us? So we have introduced another ingredient which is not immediately to do with the data, but which is some extra thing. And the main thing we get is we can have much better sense of how reliable our model is, what the errors are, how accurate we expect our parameter estimators to be. And the way to do that is we plug random values from the model, so yi, which are generated like in equation 1.3, into our parameter estimators. And because now the y in the parameter estimator are random, we can get a sense of what fluctuations do we expect. So because it's random, we could do it again and get the different answers. We can think of the variance of these answers, we can start thinking of how close or far away are the estimated alpha and beta from the true alpha and beta in this model. And this kind of result where we can have qualitative error estimates, that could not be done without a statistical model. So finally, before we finish, I want to discuss the last section the last part of this section, and that's a very short part that just introduces notation, but that is relevant because that is the notation we will be using in the slightly more complicated setting in section two. And it rewrites everything we have done basically in matrix vector notation. And when we had indices before that will now in refer to components of a vector, and where we had sums before in the residual sum of square that will be hidden in matrix vector products. And we will see over the following weeks that that notation is quite convenient. And actually I would say, would say is the key to covering the same thing for multiple linear regression where you have more than one dimension for the inputs. Okay, so let's just jump in. We just need to remember a bit of how matrices are multiplied with other matrices and with vectors. So let's just do an example matrix. So if we say we have A11 to A1n in the first row and AM1 up to AMn in the last row, then that's a matrix with M rows and N columns. So I would say that's in the vector space Rm times N, rows first, columns second, and let's call that A. And that we can multiply to vectors with n components. So if we have a vector with n components, say x1 to xn, element of the vector space Rn, then we can work out Ax, and that will be a vector again. And the i's component of this vector will be some Aij xj, where j ranges from 1 to m. So that's a formula from linear algebra. And what that means is if I want the i's components, then I take a row somewhere in here, and I take all of these elements of the vector x. And in this row i of the matrix, we have a i1 up to a i n. And then what I do is I multiply the first one here with the first one here. And I go through the whole row until I multiply the last one here with the last one here. 
and I add up all of these products. In talking about this, you may have noticed I hesitated a bit. I spotted a mistake. Hopefully you have spotted this too. Namely, that should not have been an M, but an N, because that is how many elements there are in the vector X, and that is how many elements there are in the row I of the matrix. So that is true for all I from 1 to M, all rows of the matrix, and AX is then a vector with M elements. So that's how you multiply a matrix with a vector. And now it's not entirely clear at first if we want to say yi is beta 0 plus beta 1 xi plus epsilon i, how we can write this equation as the matrix vector multiplication. But the trick is to just add a 1 here, because then at least this part is a sum of products of two terms. And it turns out that fits in nicely. So our matrix, which is called X, we call that the design matrix later, that now needs rows which have a 1 as the first element and an XI as the second element. So we write 1, X1, 1, X2, and so on, up to 1, Xn. And the thing we are multiplying with that must be a vector which has beta 0 and beta 1 as the components. So that is beta made up of beta 0 and beta 1. And if we do it like this, then x beta i's component of this vector is, now we discussed how to do that, we take a row here, which will contain 1 and xi, and we take this column, and then we do 1 times beta 0 plus xi times beta 1, and that's what we wanted. This is the expression we had up here. Good, so this is what we've covered today, and I'll see you again in the next video, which will correspond to section 2, and which will be about multiple regression, published later this week. So thank you all, and see you soon.